A quote came out of the emails, these leaked emails that said, let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. That's the words. Let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. And it sounds like collusion to mislead the public about climate change. Others have contended that because the work of Jones et al. is included in the IPCC documents, the documents are called into question, hence global warming is a lie, and we need to be concerned. And it's worth taking a little bit of time to unpack this, because it illustrates how deniers get the facts wrong, how they make erroneous inferences from those facts, and why creationists specialize in taking things out of context and distracting the audience, the public audience, with the real um, conclusion. First, the full quote from the hacked emails. I just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards, and from 1961 for heats to hide the decline. What does this mean? This email is not about the IPCC or even about climate change per se. It was about Jones's preparation of the cover of a non-academic magazine being prepared for the general public by the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. Now, when you're writing for the general public, uh, I don't have to explain that to this group, you tend to simplify. Hopefully you simplify uh, without distorting the uh, original, but you do simplify when you're dealing with the general public or students. Um, note the scale at the bottom of this chart goes from the year 1000 to the year 2000. There are thermometer measurements only from 1850 to the present. The rest of the data are proxy data derived from tree rings, corals, ice cores, lake sediments, and so forth. They're indirect measures. So what is Mike's nature trick? Mike's nature trick refers to Mike Mann's 1999 nature article on northern hemisphere temperatures. It is to use estimated proxy data for periods where there are no direct measurements, obviously, but to overlay proxy data, see the red arrow there? on the actual thermometer measurements from the 1800s on. This trick is to increase the accuracy of the data reporting. It doesn't sound terribly nefarious. Mike's nature trick, as in tricks of the trade, is also separate from high the decline. What does high the decline refer to? Well, Jones is reporting on Keith Griffith's data on dendrochronology pre ring day, which generally track temperature reliably from 1850 on, but not perfectly. For some northern boreal forest, uh, forest trees, not all parts of the world, not all tree species, but some North American trees, there's an anomalous difference in the measured temperature and the tree ring estimated temperature from about 1960 on. This is the red arrow here. And I have not really studied that. There's a literature on why this particular group of northern boreal forest trees has this situation. And, uh, here, but uh, climate scientists, uh, people who work with tree ring dating don't seem to be terribly upset about it. It's an interesting puzzle, but it's nothing that they feel is, is, is dreadful. Hence, Jones, for the purpose of this general reader magazine, was correcting the anomalous proxy data by substituting in real temperature measurements, Mike's nature trick. Now, in the actual IPCC reports, all of this is spelled out in full, unlike for a general reader publication. And in any event, the decline is not a temperature decline, but a decline in the quality of the data. But of course, this tempest in the T5 is irrelevant to the validity of the IPCC conclusions about global warming, since there are so many studies by so many investigators and so many lines of evidence pointing to recent increased temperatures. The climate gate flap is, as we have seen with creationist attacks on evolution, used to distract from the science. If you're curious about the position of anti-global warming proponents, you can check out skepticalscience.com, which lists the most frequent contrarian arguments and responses from climate science scientists. It's a very good site to know about. Skepticalscience.com. Now let's turn to our discussion in the brief time we're remaining to us to the third pillar. I want to remind you uh, uh, the third pillar is the fairness pillar in creationism. It's um, the, the related pillar is the um, teach both to avoid dogma and promote critical thinking. We certainly have this uh, in um, great uh, abundance with the creationists. Uh, here's Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute saying, we 
believe you should pedagogically insist on the permissive freedom for teachers to talk about other theories in addition to evolution. Other theories is a euphemism. Um, but let us go. And um, similarly, <clears throat> the implication is that teaching only global warming and not contrarian positions is censoring, banning debate, and so forth. Uh, this from a Heartland Institute uh, spokesperson. The goal should be to get politics out of the classroom, not protected by banning debate and censoring objective sources of research. Uh, banning debate, censoring, those are all very negative terms. Certainly. We wouldn't want to be caught doing things like that. I mentioned earlier that we were encountering legislation that bundled evolution with climate change. These are generally called academic freedom laws, and there have been quite a few of them over the past five or six years. Academic freedom laws are primarily a creationist enthusiasm, and every piece of legislation is not identical, but some of the proposed laws do include global warming, and I've indicated those with asterisks. Coming soon to a state near you, or perhaps your very own state, shall we say. The bills all sound very reasonable to most people because they use phrases like teach the full range of views of evolution and global warming or critically evaluate evolution and global warming or present all relevant scientific information about global warming and evolution, etc. And why not present information for and against the scientific theories? That's exactly what scientists do, right? Yeah, but ninth graders aren't scientists. And again, there's, there's this disconnect between what the public uh, cottons to immediately because the fairness pillar is so very powerful for us as um, people in, growing up in a democratic society in which we want all voices to be heard and we have vigorous debate in town and town meetings, and, and that's great, you know? But science isn't quite like that, and science education isn't quite like that either. It's not that the job of the K-12 teacher is to present a consensus view of science because these are early learners, they're beginning learners, they're just getting familiarity with the arguments and with science itself. To expect them to sort out the medieval war period controversy is expecting a little bit too much. Alternatively, who's got the time to do all of this? You'll never get the photosynthesis if you spend this much time on all this other stuff. The goal of a secondary school educator the goal of a secondary school education is rather different from that of a research scientist. Now, such views also do not understand an important fact about the content of science, and that these explanations that come out of the scientific process, uh, you don't just present views willy-nilly as a means of balance. Now, the majority of states require at least some reference to either the causes, mechanisms, impact, or mitigation of climate change, but it's still fairly thin out there. I'm hoping the new science education standards will probably include more, which will make interesting the political discussions that will take place in some states. Uh, perhaps uh, Helen Quinn will be addressing this in her comments a little bit later. Pardon me? Helen says 20 states have signed up already. Good, that is an excellent start. Something teachers may want to keep an eye out for is that in the interest of giving balance to all points of views, lesson plans have kindly been prepared for nonprofits associated with fossil fuel industries such as the American Coal Foundation. This lesson on coal and the greenhouse effect provides balance that calls into question standard science regarding CO2 and certainly does not reflect the scientific consensus. Note the last sentence in this. More time is needed for researchers to gather information on these questions. No need for those warning labels on cigarettes. The jury is still out. <laughs> we probably don't really need more research to show the effect of CO2 on warming. Sorry, guys. So where do you go for more information? Uh, if you consider the anti-evolution and anti-global warming movements, these two confrontational issues, there also are a series of ecological niches, if you will. And where can teachers go to find information on these niches? If you want scientific analyses of evolution and global warming, there are many places where you can go. You can go to pandasthumb.org, you can go to realclimate.org. Uh, both of these are really good sites for scientific analysis.